Hello everyone and welcome back to our channel. Uh, today I am picking back up on a series that I recorded the intro for, I'll just put the link up here, a while ago and then I just didn't get around to continuing the series because, well, life got in the way as it does sometimes. So I'm picking it back up. This is the timeline of the history of herbalism and as I described, in the intro, I do want you to remember that the history of herbalism that is documented in the sources that I can gain access to is incredibly um, limited. It, it's very dominated by certain perspectives um, and documentation of the history of herbalism systems outside of a few is really spotty and um, not always from trustworthy sources. So <clears throat> I apologize, I'm a little raspy today. Unfortunately, the history of herbalism is controlled by a few major schools. I've done my best to document outside of that. Um, I know it's lacking and I've already gone into it in the intro, so I'm not going to you know, really go into it now, but I just wanted to be clear that, you know, that's a lacking that I, I recognize and it bothers me too. Anyway, um, let's get started. And as always, please remember that if you like our content, you should subscribe to our channel. Please remember to like this particular video and give us a comment below, you know, things that you like, things that you don't like, um, content that you'd hope to see. Uh, and we really appreciate you sticking with us. Lastly, if um, you're new to our channel, maybe you don't know, but patrons do gain access to uh, our notes on all of these topics, um, even starting at a dollar a month. And um, patrons at the $30 and up level actually receive books of um, our series. So I'll be posting actually soon a video going over the books that we put out because I'm, I'm pretty proud of them. You can find a link to our Patreon below and um, let's get started. Prehistoric herbal medicine. Unfortunately, in many cases, there is nothing even approaching a written record um, of prehistoric societies and the medicine that they used. A lot of how we know anything comes from paleopathology. Paleopathology is the study of ancient diseases and the injuries that are found in organisms and through the evidence in the fossils and mummified tissues and skeletal remains and historic sites. Um, it's so, so important to understanding ancient cultures and ancient medicines to understand the diseases that they faced, the challenges that they faced, and how they survived them. The study of paleopathology is how we know a lot about ancient herbal medicine, the diseases that they survived and how they might have survived them. We also know from the study of bones and the study of teeth and the study of these historic sites, mummified tissues, skeletal remains, etc., um, that ancient people cared for their young, cared for their old, and cared for their sick and their injured. Um, we have found herbs at ancient sites, things that did not provide enough in terms of energy to have been eaten as a food source and almost certainly would have been used either as a flavoring for food or as medicine. And there are reasons to believe that it was as medicine in many cases. We can also study living Stone Age societies. There are some uh, that have remained Stone Age um, from an anthropological point of view in Africa, New Guinea, and Australia. And we can look at how they make use of herbal medicines and make some theories as to how ancient peoples would have made use of herbal medicine as well. From 80,000 BCE to current, non-human primates have been established as ingesting medicinal plants in order to treat illness, and both the oral records of First Nations peoples dating back to Paleolithic times 
and in modern scientific observations. It may then be theorized that ancient humans did so as well. Now I just want to touch on this, what do I mean of oral records of First Nations people? How do we know what they said? Well, the oral record has recorded it down to modern times. And First Nations oral accounts have been found to be incredibly accurate, like astonishingly accurate. So when they say, our ancient ancestors observed animals, saw animals make use of this medicine, and so we tried it too, we can assume that that is exactly what happened tens of thousands of years ago. 60,000 BCE, Paleolithic herbalism. Paleolithic herbalism may have looked very similar in some ways to herbalism today. Archaeological sites have revealed remains of plants that modern herbalists still use. A Neanderthal burial unearthed at an archaeological site in Shanandar in northern Iraq revealed that a person had been buried on soil covered with grape hyacinth, yarrow, ephedra, henbane, St. Barnaby's thistle, and marshmallow pollen. Recent studies on Neanderthal tooth plaque also suggest that Neanderthals ate or chewed on yarrow, chamomile, and poplar. 25,000 BCE in what is now modern-day France. The first victorial evidence of herbal medicine may date as far back as this site. It is found on the walls of the La Soul Caves in France and was radiocarbon dated to between 13,000 and 25,000 BCE. 14,000 BCE, Chile. One way that archaeologists establish that evidence supports medicinal use of plant matter rather than only the use of plant matter as a source of sustenance, is that the plant matter found in historic sites just simply does not supply adequate calories to explain its use and preservation as a food source. And so the plant matter must have been gathered for other reasons. Plant remains of this type were discovered at Mount Verde, a Paleo-American site in Chile. The plant remains were found in a wishbone-shaped structure that was separated from the rest of the encampment and primarily consisted of chewed boldo plant, which is still used medicinally by the local First Nations population. Along with the boldo plant remains, thousands of lycopodium spores were also found, which may have been used to treat skin ailments. Some historians theorize that the wishbone-shaped structure was used by a medicine worker or healer and was separated away from the rest of the encampment for medical-related needs, such as containment and quiet. 9,000 to 5,000 BCE, entheogenic mushroom use. Hallucinogenic mushrooms have been part of human culture as far back as the earliest recorded history. Murals dated 9,000 to 7,000 BCE found in the Sahara in southeast Algeria depict horned beings dressed as dancers holding mushroom-like objects. A figure is depicted surrounded by an aura of mushrooms, head bursting open with what appears to be an artistic depiction of an entheogenic experience. 6,000-year-old pictographs discovered near the Spanish town of Villar del Humo illustrate several mushrooms that have been tentatively idea identified a Psilocybe hispanica, a hallucinogenic species native to the area. In the winter of 1991, hikers in the Italian Alps came across the well-preserved remains of a man who died 5,300 years ago, approximately 200 years after the Tassili cave paintings were created. Dubbed the Iceman by the news media, he was found with a knapsack, flint axe, a string of dried birch polypore fungi, Piptorporis betulinus, and an as yet unidentified mushroom. The polypores can be used as tinder for starting fires and as medicine for treating wounds. Further, a rich tea with immuno-enhancing properties can be prepared by boiling these mushrooms. The common theory is that he carried the mushrooms for their entheogenic properties. So you have from 9,000 to 5,000 BCE the establishment of these entheogenic mushrooms in use either as medicine, because we know now that they can be used to treat PTSD, anxiety, depression, <clears throat> or for their spiritual uh, practice. So we know they're in use, um, and how much is one kind of medicine, and how much is a different kind of medicine? Unfortunately, we don't know. 8,000 to 5,000 BCE, the New Stone Age. Major changes occurred in the cultures of the Stone Age across the world. During the transition from the Paleolithic to the Neolithic period, many cultures transitioned from food gathering to food producing. 
Stone was turned into tools, allowing for the creation of more durable tools and advancements in farming and harvesting. Stone Age lake dwellers in Europe cultivated or gathered over 200 different plant species, among which were many that were not collected as a source of calories, so are assumed to have been collected for medicinal or entheogenic value. These include plants that are still used in herbalism today, opium poppies, dwarf elder, common fumatory, common verbena, wild sweet william, and bog bean. Some of these Stone Age societies, as we said, do still exist to this day, and one of the ways that we can establish what plants were used is what they're still using now. 5000 to 4000 BCE, Siberian shamanism and Aboriginal bush medicine were both practiced during this time period. The tradition of Siberian shamanism developed in Eurasia, and although a spiritual practice, shamanism was and is a medicinal practice as well. The herbs, native plants, and fungi of the region were part of their traditional practices and, again, remain so to this day. The same is also true of Aboriginal bush medicine in that it is both a spiritual and a medicinal tradition and that the same herbs that they used at, you know, the Paleolithic times remain the herbs that they use to this day. And we know that because they told us um, and we have no reason to doubt them, especially as in, in the case of like the Aboriginals, their oral accounts have proven accurate back tens and twenties and thirties and thousands of years. Like their oral accounts are fantastically accurate. Moving right along, 5000 BCE, the Sumerian tablets. The oldest written evidence of herbal medicine usage was found on Sumerian clay tablets in Nagpur that are approximately 5,000 years old. They comprise 12 recipes for drug preparations referring to over 250 various plants, some of them containing alkaloids that, while well, we still make use of today, um, such as poppy, henbane, and mandrake. 4000 BCE, the roots of Chinese medicine and Ayurveda. In China, the oral roots of traditional Chinese medicine were beginning to be transcribed, though how far back the practice dates hasn't actually been established. It is entirely possible and actually probable that traditional Chinese medicine is far older than the written record of traditional Chinese medicine. In India, the roots of what we would now describe as Ayurvedic medicine were being practiced and shared orally at this time as well. Ayurvedic medicine has used many of the same herbs and plant medicines consistently over the course of its development. For example, turmeric has been part of Ayurvedic medicine at least as far back as 4000 BCE, and its usage has remained consistent. 3000 to 1500 BCE, the medical theories of ancient Egypt. Ancient Egyptian medicine dates at least as far back as 3000 BCE, although the Ebers Papyrus, which is the most famous of the medical texts, dates back only to 1500 BCE. There is an ongoing debate on the accuracy of the translations of ancient Egyptian medical texts, as translators have a lack of complete knowledge of the ancient Egyptian language. Current translations are composed of mere approximations between the ancient Egyptian language and modern ideas, so it should be assumed that any translation is not completely accurate. Nine principal medical papyri are currently documented as having survived to be translated at least in part. They are called after their original owners, Edwin Smith, Chester Beatty, Carlsberg, the site of their discovery, Cahun, Ramesum, the towns where they were kept, Leiden, London, Berlin, or their editors, Ebers. The Cahun Medical Papyrus is the oldest of the ancient Egyptian medical papyri that has been translated. It dates to 1900 BCE and was discovered at Fayum and was called by mistake the Cahun Papyrus. On the back of the papyrus is an account from the time of Amenemhat III, 1840 BCE to 1792 BCE. The original form from which it was copied is also likely the oldest of the lost source papyri. The Cahun Medical Papyrus consists of three sections, one dealing with human medicine, one with veterinary science, and one with mathematics. It is primarily written in hieratic handwriting, like the other papyri, except the veterinary section, 
which is written in hieroglyphic, a script usually reserved for theological writings and which may mean the veterinary section was copied from an even older original medical papyri. The first two pages contain 17 gynecological prescriptions and instructions without titles. There is no documentation of surgery, but rather only medicinal substances, including beer, milk, oil, dates, herbs, incense, and sometimes substances we would find repulsive, like feces. Use is often made of fumigations, pastes, and vaginal applications. The third page contains 17 prescriptions concerning fertility, pregnancy, and childbirth. The Ramusium 4th and 5th papyri were probably written around 1900 BCE as well. Ramusium 4th contains many identical prescriptions as the Cahoon papyrus and is also concerned with labor and birth. It also contains one anti-conceptional formula made out of crocodile dung, which completes a similar one found in the Cahoon papyrus. The papyrus V is purely medical. Only 20 prescriptions survive, as, such, as much of the papyrus has been lost. This papyrus was written in hieroglyphic script and not in hieratic. The London medical papyrus was claimed to be discovered by the priests of the Temple of Tebmut in the Sanctuary of the Goddess. Behold! The darkness of the night enveloped the earth, but the moon cast her beams upon all pages of this book, and it was brought to the treasury of His Majesty, King Khufu. The aforementioned Ebers Papyrus, written circa 1550 BCE, represents a collection of earlier knowledge. The Ebers Papyrus is the longest of all the known papyri. It is complete even to modern day, totaling 108 pages, and bears the date of the ninth year of the reign of Amenophis I, 1550 BCE. It was a compilation of important and diverse Egyptian medical texts from the previous centuries, which allows historians to establish that the practices it documents date back as far further than the papyrus itself. The papyrus consists of more than 800 prescriptions and refers to 700 plant species and drugs used in ancient Egyptian medicine, such as pomegranate, castor oil plant, aloe, senna, garlic, onion, fig, willow, coriander, juniper, common centauri, cannabis, and mandrake. The herbs used by the ancient Egyptians included those grown locally in their region and those that were imported from Asia and the Near Middle East, which may actually inform us of herbs that were being used in the ancient medical traditions of those areas as they were apparently exporting them. It also treatises on areas of medicine including gynecology, psychiatry, and dentistry. The papyrus consists of a list of ailments and then their treatments, ranging from diseases of the limb to diseases of the skin. The treatments in the papyrus focus on addressing symptoms rather than the root of illness or disease, likely because the Egyptians did not realize that the symptoms weren't the disease. It is likely that there are earlier, lost, and currently unknown papyri on the collection and preparation of the remedies included in the Ebers papyrus, as the Ebers papyrus assumes any physician making use of it already possesses the knowledge on how to make the various remedies. The Book of the Heart, a chapter of the Ebers papyrus, tells of three kinds of healers, the physician, the priest, and the sorcerer. The Hearst Papyrus consists of 18 and a half pages, which describe 260 medical cases, of which 96 are also found in the Ebers Papyrus. It also contains a chapter on bone afflictions. The Berlin Papyrus consists of 25 pages and contains 240 recipes, of which three are written in a different handwriting. A large part of its contents consists of inaccurate, error-laden, word-for-word repetition of certain paragraphs of the Ebers and Hearst Papyri, implying that it was copied and not copied well. Commonly used herbs and medicines across all of the papyri include senna, honey, thyme, juniper, frankincense, cumin, colocanth, pomegranate root, henbane, flax, oak gall, pine tar, manna, bayberry, ami, alkanet, acanthus, aloe, caraway, cedar, coriander, cypress, elderberry, fennel, garlic, wild lettuce, nasturtium, onion, peppermint, papyrus, poppy plant, saffron, sycamore, watermelon, wheat, and zyphus lotus. Other than papyri, evidence of the herbal medicines used in ancient Egypt in this period have been found in tomb illustrations and in jars containing traces of plant matter. 3000 BCE Sumer, willow bark was recorded on a stone tablet of Medic 
of medical remedies from the third dynasty of Ur, and it was also mentioned on the aforementioned Ebers Papyrus. 2800 BCE, Shen Nung, the Divine Husbandman. Shen Nung is referred to as the father of Chinese medicine, and although much about him remains unknown, including when exactly he lived and died, he is credited with introducing acupuncture as a healing therapy. So little is known about him that he may in fact be a mythical figure created to represent the group of people who created the philosophical foundations of traditional Chinese medicine. Please know that I cannot pronounce Mandarin or Cantonese at all and that I know I'm horrible at it and that I'm actually trying to work on it, but it is a slow progress. Right. 2600 BCE. The Egyptian Imhotep, a priest physician, described the diagnosis and treatment of 200 diseases. He was later deified as the Egyptian god of medicine. 2500 to 1000 BCE. Babylonian and Syrian medicine flourished during this time period and also formed a bridge between Egypt and Greece, whereby both medicinal knowledge and the herb themselves were transmitted across cultures. A lot of our assumptions about herbal medicine come from trade records, where we can see that plant matter was being taken across roots, spanning many nations. So we know that they valued these plants, they made use of them across different cultures, enough to take the costly endeavor of transporting them long distances. 2000 BCE to 1000 BCE. Cis and burial sites dated to Bronze Age people around the world have found evidence of medicinal herb being left with the bodies. In European Bronze Age burial cysts, birch bark and meadowsweet have been found. Both are indigenous to the UK and would likely have been used as hot water infusions and in the creation of herbal meads. The UK sites where meadowsweets have been found include Fanfoil in Wales and Fort Teviot Ashgrove, North Mains in Scotland. Cyprus was also found in dental remains in the Shetland site of St. Ninians, and it is theorized it may have been used to treat teeth ailments. 1900 to 1600 BCE. Akkadian clay tablets on medicine survive, although the originals are lost and what survives to this day are primarily copies of earlier texts. The copies were preserved in Ashurbanipal's library at Nineveh. 1800 BCE. The Code of Hammurabi decried fees for surgeons and punishments for malpractice. 1800 BCE, medicinal plants were carved on stone in Habarabai's kingdom in Babylon. 1800 to 1500 BCE, trade through the Near East, Asia, and Egypt. An extensive trade route through Mesopotamia, India, and Egypt allowed for the dissemination of knowledge of medicinal plants across the cultures of the regions, as well as trade in seeds and dried plant stores. Stone carvings show cross-cultural use of juniper, fennel, linseed, white poppy, saffron, and cannabis. 1800 to 1500 BCE, Mesopotamia. A growing demand for herbal medicine in Mesopotamia necessitated a specialized profession called a rhizotomoki, or root gatherer. 1500 to 500 BCE, the Artha Varveda. The earliest surviving Sanskrit documents detailing the basis of Ayurvedic system of medicine, such as the Rig Veda, which was potentially created between 1500 BCE and 1000 BCE, and the Athara Veda, 1000 to 900 BCE, were likely being created during this time period. Many herbs and minerals now used in Ayurvedic medicine were described over the course of the first millennium BCE by Indian herbalists, such as Sharaka and Shushruta. Notably, the Shushruta Samhita, attributed to Shushruta in the 6th century BCE, describes 700 medicinal plants, as well as 64 remedies from mineral sources and a further 57 from animal sources. All right, I've gotten through a lot of that, and I'm trying to keep these videos to about a half an hour. So tune in next time, and we'll pick up on the timeline where we left off. If this is helpful to you, please consider becoming a patron so that I can send you the actual notes that go along with this. Um, 
and maybe even become a patron at a higher benefit tier, which would mean that when this gets turned into a book, you get a physical copy. Anyway, thank you very much for joining us and please remember to like and subscribe. And if you do like our content, um, leave a comment below saying what you like and what you'd like to see more of. I really appreciate you tuning in and sticking through this very boring recitement of historical events, but, uh, well, it's not boring to me, obviously. Um, this is what I, I love. Anyway, thank you for joining us, and I hope that you're safe out there. But anyway, you can find a link The perils of lip gloss. <laughs> I don't know why I trip over my tongue so much, but I do. I'll be doing just fine, and then my tongue will just be like, you know what, we're gonna pretend that we're tying a cherry stem in a knot right now, and just forget whatever word you were going for, because you're not gonna manage it.